welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, and joining us, as always, is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Jason. Good to see you, Christian. You too. And we're actually joined by two special guests today, Neil Lozen and Nate Dappen. Great to be here. Hey, guys. We're so happy to have you. Good up. So um, I'll just start by by reading your bios here because um, they're they're a little bit uh, unique uh, for people we've had on the show before. Uh, Neil Lozen is a biologist, photographer, and filmmaker based in State College, Pennsylvania. He was named a National Geographic Young Explorer in 2009 while studying invasive lizards in Florida and Puerto Rico. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Very unique. Have we ever had someone? Um, have we ever had a PhD or, or doctoral anybody on the show before? Christian? No, I mean, this is an incredible, I mean, and you know what? I dug into his resume, like on his own website and I'm sitting here going, I told, I texted Jason last night. I'm like, the more I read these, the more I just want to crawl under my desk and never come out. Like, how do these people accomplish all of this stuff? Uh, it's incredible. If you get a chance, um, we're going to put their website in the link um, to their company, and you can go and read um, both Neil and Nate's uh, bios and, yeah, yeah, be amazed. Which I'm now going to read Nate's bio. Uh, Nate Dappen is a biologist, photographer, and filmmaker based in San Diego, California. He studied sexual and... Uh, ontogenetic? Is that how you say that? <laughs> uh, color close evolution. <laughs> yeah, pe- people can Google it. <laughs> color evolution in the Ibiza uh, wall lizard in grad school at the University of Miami, earning his PhD in biology in 2012. So, thank you both for, for coming on here. Christian, do you want to talk a little bit about um, why we're having these two esteemed guests with us? Yeah, you know, we really are trying to launch our podcast in the direction of bringing more filmmakers on to hear about their experience. I said last week that you can come and listen to this podcast and hear my experience as a documentary filmmaker, but my experience is not going to be someone else's. Um, it, every film is going to be unique to each filmmaker. So we wanted to have some um, different filmmakers on to talk about their experience. And I reached out to, uh, well, actually, their PR agent reached out to me and said, hey, you want to have these guys on and when I read their story and I saw that uh, this documentary series is just now coming to PBS I was like let's do it so congratulations you guys I know um, it just launched right now we're recording on June 7th um, but this series Human Footprint just launched on PBS so congratulations talk to me a little bit about that and how exciting Uh, it's been awesome Uh, so excited to finally see a project we've been really killing ourselves on for a few years, finally sort of, sort of hit the audiences. Um, it's been, it was really rewarding. We had a, we actually had a premiere here locally in San Diego that Neil flew out for, um, at the San Diego natural history museum and seeing it on the big screen with an audience was amazing and, uh, definitely got a lot of love after the first episode aired. So I feel very, very happy that it's finally out there. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Nate, tell me a little bit about uh, how this whole series came together and just explain to us what Human Footprint is um, and, you know, just unpack it a little bit so we can understand what we're about to talk about. Sure. Human Footprint is uh, a six part documentary science series that is all about how humans transform the planet, the ways in which we do it. But it's very much an exploration of what those things that we do to the planet, what those things say about who we are as a species. So in the same way that Parts Unknown is a food show that's very much about history and culture, this is very much a science show that's about human history and culture. Um, so that's that's kind of the base of the series. Um, Neil, do you want to talk a little bit about how it got started? Yeah, sure. So, um, so Shane Campbell Staten is the host of this series. Uh, he's an evolutionary biologist, um, so has very similar professional training to uh, what Nate and I have, except that he didn't then go and become a filmmaker like, like we did. Um, he, he stayed on the academic track. He's a professor at Princeton. Um, but we actually met Shane when he was still a grad student. Um, we actually filmed him for another uh, program that we were producing for Smithsonian Channel called Laws of the Lizard. He studied lizards just like we did. And, uh, and Shane later joined us as part of a science communication workshop that we were leading. Um, and at that workshop, you know, uh, Nate and I had been toying 
with the idea for a couple of years of, of pitching a series about evolution in the age of humans, it's basically how humans shape the process of evolution um, and change kind of the evolutionary trajectories that, that animals and plants are on. And um, Shane came to us after the workshop and he said, guys, I have this idea for a series about evolution in the age of humans. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We've been thinking about that exact same thing. Except then he said, I think I should be the host of this series. And we were like, wow, that, that is interesting. You know, we, we hadn't been thinking about it um, as a hosted series. We had been thinking mm -hmm. like a little bit more traditional sort of like voice of God narration um, science series. And, uh, and that gave it, you know, that sort of lit a fire under us. And, and at the same time, I think kind of gave the pitch the secret sauce that it needed um, to really capture the attention of, of some commissioners. Yeah, the one Shane thing I'll is... add, Oh, please, oh, I was going to say the one, yeah, the one thing I'll add to that story that, that Neil left out is that we, so we came into the show with, with Shane, we developed this idea of evolution in the age of humans. And we brought that to PBS We created a sizzle. We invested pretty heavily in it. They loved it. But when we started brainstorming with them, our executive producer, Bill Gardner was like, yeah, this is cool. Like I could see making a limited series about this, but I think once you've done one series about human driven evolution, I think that, that might be all you get. Like, how can we, adapt this and tweak it and turn it into something that's returnable. Um, he's like, what if this was all his, this was his contribution, his initial contribution. He's like, what if you, what if you make it not just about evolution, but about all the ways we transform the planet? And wow. what if you call the human footprint? And that I think really changed our thinking about it in a profound way. And then all of a sudden we were like, Oh my God, there's literally infinite topics that you can cover that relate to how we transform the planet. Some of the stories are about evolution, but certainly not the vast majority of them in the, in, in the series. It's, it's, a, it's a show about broad ways in which we, we, we affect the planet. Yeah, and one of the things that I love about this series is that I always want my audience to walk away changed and to think about how they can make a change um, in you know, their lives and in the community that they live in. And I feel like this series does that in, in, you know, a very ambitious and powerful way because it makes you realize, it wakes you up to realize how much you do affect just by living and what your choices are and what you do impact not only your those in your immediate surroundings, like your family or your community, but the whole world. Um, and I was convicted because on this podcast, I talked about like a couple of years ago, going to Europe and to the Bois Jacques, which is where a band of brothers, you know, the Battle of the Bulge took place. And I brought home a piece of bark and a little bit of moss. And I didn't even think about how that was probably a really bad thing, but I was convicted. <laughs> I thought about this when I was watching like, oh my gosh, I'm so guilty. What did I bring back? <laughs> so I love it that there was uh, that sort of call to action uh, just really making me think. Which yeah. I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, I went grocery shopping after watching three episodes of this last night. And I was standing in the produce aisle and I was just like, there's papayas and pineapple. And I was just looking around at all these things that are like, I shouldn't have these in northern Illinois <laughs> right now. <laughs> How did these get here? What's the impact of all these being here? And it was just like. It was kind of making my, my brain spin a little bit just thinking about all the different things that we do, and I don't even think about them. I just walk in and pay $5 for this, and, uh, and, I, and I'm on my way. And this show really already had that impact on me just last night. And that's so great to hear. I mean, I think I think that's, that's really all we want out of this, right? We're not – I don't think we're trying to be prescriptive and saying do this, don't do that. It's really just – I think raising raising people's level of awareness of, of just how large the impacts of our species have been um, and how everything we do, it's not just the things we eat. It's not just, you know, the, the places we live in, but it's 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 our whims, too. It's it's the little things that we do that have these unexpected sort of ripple effects around the world. And if we can just encourage people to think about those things as they go about their day, I think that's a huge first step toward you know, hopefully uh, moving our whole species toward a, a much more, you know, uh, harmonious future with the planet. 
Totally agree. So before we get too far away from your bios, uh, you know, you talked about how you met Shane and it was kind of all revolving around lizards and your, you know, biology study. Um, I just want to understand how you go from that to becoming filmmakers, because a lot of people listen to our podcast and they have various and sundry backgrounds and jobs and they want to make a film, um, but they have no idea how to get from here to there. So tell us about your journey. I'd love to hear both of your journeys. Maybe they're similar, but we'll start with you, Nate. Yeah, so um, in undergrad, I, I double majored in biology and art. Um, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, so I was, I was pre-med too. Um, but I, in, in the art realm, I, I really majored in arts so that I could use the, the dark room because where I was doing my undergrad, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, use the dark room unless you were uh, an art major. So I, I did that and continued afterwards to work professionally as a photographer before I went to grad school uh, for biology. And then in biology, um, when, I was, when I was in grad school, I met Neil at this field course in Costa Rica. I was doing my PhD at the University of Miami. Neil was at UCLA. And um, we met and we were the exact same height. We both had long hair. We were both serious photographers. And in, in Neil's words, we, we could either decide to join forces or destroy one another. <laughs> and um, so we, we joined forces. And I mean, at, at the early, in the early days, we were just friends. You know, we, we were photographing, we were collaborating on research projects. And this was right around the time that SLRs started shooting high quality digital videos. And so these, these tools that we really knew how to use already pretty well, um, we could start shooting on. And Neil at the time had gotten this National Geographic uh, grant and they were letting him blog on the, on the, uh, on the National Geographic website. And so we started making terrible, just terrible short films about our research. And you can still watch them, you know, they're like us running around catching lizards and, um, you know, but, but, but uh, at the time, very, the time very like Steve Irwin. Very like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's that? What's that PBS show? Um, the, uh, with the two guys, um, it's a kid wild, show. Wild Kratz. Wild, yeah. It's like Wild Kratz, uh, Wild Kratz. It's a uh, total yeah, Wild totally. Kratz. Um, but, but, um, at the time nobody was making, almost nobody was making science films for YouTube. And so, um, you know, like when short categories opened up at science filmmaking fil festivals, our films made it in cause everybody's films were terrible. Um, and, and so it was really encouraging and that kind of snowballed and we started getting better at it. And as we got close to finishing our PhDs, we had made a few dozen films and, um, we kind of together were like, Hey, you want to, you want to, should we try to do this? And, um, I think it would have been scary to do on our own, but I think together really believing in each other and pushing each other and feeling like we had somebody to back us up. We, we just took the plunge and sort of, as soon as we finished, you know, went full, full board into, into this and. You know, we got a couple of grants and stuff early on that really helped us out. But um, it went from making short films for the web to making broadcast films to making broadcast series now. Um, and we still do a lot of shorts, uh, too. But that, that was kind of the path. I don't know. Well, if you Neil, do you have anything yeah. to add to that? Um, I guess, I mean, I think a lot of our background is really similar. Um, I would say photographically, my background was a little different. I, I started photographing in high school, you know, shooting on slide film, um, always wanting to be a wildlife photographer. Um, and, and that was really my focus, you know, I was doing a lot of like bird photography and stuff. And, and where Nate was making, you know, making some of his income in grad school, like, you know, shooting weddings and events and stuff like that. I was making some of my income licensing photos to books and magazines, you know, wildlife photos to books and magazines. Um, and I think our, our skills in photography um, and sort of by extension, some of the skills we brought into filmmaking complemented each other really well in that way. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, you know, I did go and look at both of your photography. Uh, you are incredibly talented just in the photography alone. And what I am wondering, like with your bio uh, biology majors, did you think maybe there wasn't a living to be made in the art world or in the photography world? And you were like, I really need to have some sort of backup, so I'm going to get a biology degree. What were you thinking? Uh, I think for me, my my idols, uh, the people who I, you know, who really inspired me, um, were folks that, that did some of both. And so there were, there were people like, 
who are a little bit more on the photography side, like like National Geographic photographer Tim Lehman. Um, you know, I looked at his work. He got a PhD in biology, and then you know his photography sort of ended up taking the lead, and he got these amazing stories for National Geographic, but brought his science expertise to those stories. It was part of what made his work so great. Um, and then people on the other side of the equation, like like um, Peter Nazkrecki, uh, who is a Harvard entomologist, um, happens to be like one of the world's leading uh, taxonomists of Orthoptera, the group of insects that include, includes grasshoppers and crickets. Um, but he's also one of the best macro photographers in the world. And so I would see these people who had sort of fused the two. And I thought that there was a, a path for me there too. And exactly where I would end up in that path, where, whether I'd be like more on the photography side or more on the science side, I don't think I was ever really sure um, until, you know, we, I met Nate and we started making films together. And it was like, oh, this is, this is something cool that really does combine these in, a, in a, an exciting way. Well, since you didn't have a film degree, did you guys just teach yourself? how to make a movie on the short little films that you were making? We did. We, we taught ourselves. Um, you know, one of the early things that was very available on YouTube was tutorials. Um, you know, so you could kind of learn how to do craft stuff as much, you know, there's unlimited amounts of information on that. But I don't know, like, I, I think Neil and I didn't do much of that. We just went out. I think we believed in ourselves. I think we thought we were way better than we were. <laughs> and, and, and we just, we just went out and made a lot of mistakes and made a lot of terrible films. And, um, I think we were, um, at a stage of our life where I, I don't think we were very motivated by money. You know, I think we just were like, we were just going to go play around outside and make films about things we think is interesting. And I, I, I don't, know what Neil's perspective is on this. I've actually never asked you this, but like, I don't think I had a goal. Like, I don't know what, I didn't know where we were going. I just was like, this is awesome. I love my buddy, love going out and doing this stuff. And it's like, every project was so exciting. Every time you come back with footage, it's like, that's so awesome. And then you look back on a monthly and you're like, that's so terrible. How can we do better? <laughs> yeah. And Neil would do something that was so good. And I'd be like, I hate him. I got to do it better than him. And then it sort of was like competition and pushing. And, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, it's easy to go back and tell a story, but I, I certainly did not know where we were going. No, I, I do think, I do think it's easy to gloss over the importance of us living on two different coasts and not actually being able to directly collaborate on any of the things we were making. Um, because it was exactly the dynamic that Nate just described. It was like, I would see the latest thing that Nate, you know, made and he would put up a rough cut and, and ask me like what I thought of it. And I'd be like, God damn it. It's so good. <laughs> and then I, like, I would be so, so motivated to like make the next thing that I shot, like look even better. And I think we pushed each other a lot in those first couple of years. And in fact, we've never lived in the same place through our, through our, uh, what now, like 16 year partnership. Wow. Yeah, somehow probably still see each other more than we see our partners. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. My film company is a virtual film company. Everybody lives, you know, I have people living here all over the U.S. and then in, um, it's, you know, France. It is possible now. I mean, thank goodness for all of these virtual tools that we can be a virtual, you know, office all the time. So that's really great for you guys, for sure. Yeah. Of course, yeah. as we've grown, you know, we have sort of centralized things a bit more in San Diego. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of the outlier being in, being in central Pennsylvania, um, where my, my wife's a professor at Penn state, but, um, I feel like otherwise I'd probably be in San Diego, but, um, but this way I get to, uh, I get to not deal with a lot of the administrative headache of every day. <laughs> Neil gets to be the good cop. Yep. That's a beautiful thing. All yeah. right. Let's get back. I, I have, you know, so many questions. So, um, the I, next actually, one, yes, I want, I want to interject here. You talk yes. about San Diego. Um, I actually know somebody who works for you guys. <laughs> um, oh, really? David, David Hutchinson. Um, oh, David. Yeah. Yeah. He's a phenomenal Oops. guy. Um, I, <laughs> I mostly know his wife, actually. I, um, I know her, okay. um, but I've, I've spent a good amount of time with David and I accidentally fell asleep at his house once. Uh, <laughs> he's just <laughs> a super awesome dude. I, I, as soon as I saw that you guys were coming on, like I'd, heard that david was working on something at, at, at pbs like I'd, I'd you know heard little um whispers of that and so then i was like i just scrolled down i was like oh i know him 
That's so cool. So what did he so, do on this project? Yeah, I would love to hear about his role in this. So D- David's contributions were invaluable. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's funny because he spent probably the least time in the field um, of any of our production staff. Obviously, you know, he spent more time in the field than the post-production staff. But um, because he's been wrapped up in his, his own project, um, which... Uh, we're not at liberty to, to tell, tell you anything about really, but it's, it's really, it's really impressive. Uh, he's been doing amazing work on this other project, but he did come in the field on a handful of shoots for human footprint. And he played a massive role in development for human footprint because, hmm. um, our team was still really small, uh, when we first got a little bit of development money from PBS to sort of flesh out this concept. And he played a really instrumental role in sort of the initial research and developing all the different episode pitches that we put together. Um, and a lot of things that, that he put together, you know, at that phase basically came to be in the series um, because, you know, his research was rock solid and, and, um, and he had a great sense of what was going to be a good story. So yeah, his fingerprints are all over the series. I think despite not having actually spent that much hands-on time in the field on it. Wow. Wow, we're going to have to have him come on to talk about that next important project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, (laughs) you have to use your connections, Jason. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so back back to our questions. Um, You know, we talked about uh, how this you know kind of came about, how you guys um, fell into filmmaking, I guess. Um, But talk about um, you know how long this series you know, took to come together from the concept to pre and post production all the way through to distribution. Like what was the timeline? That's question number one. And then roped into that. I would love to hear how you began the partnership with Shane, who is the host and PBS. And so, either one of you can take that. Yeah. So maybe Neil, you, you can talk more about Shane. I'll talk about timing. Um, sure. I guess, you know, it, it took us three years to get the show greenlit. And we invested a ton of time and resources of, of our own time and resources to sort of make it happen. So we came up with the idea with Shane, um, and then spent about 2017, 2017. Uh, so six, yeah, so six wow. years from start to finish. Wow. Um, and, and, uh, you know, there's just, there's not a lot of networks that do big series, like science series that like, I don't, what is there four or five? And, um, there's not, there's only a handful of production companies that those networks trust to, to do these kinds of things. And in our classic naive fashion, we always just pretended like we knew how to do things. And, um, so we, we were like, let's just make it big. And, and we, we started pitching it. We pitched the evolution version of the show a bunch and we got some bites and nibbles, but nobody was really interested. And then, um, finally we got PBS to sign on to it. Um, and then it took about a year after they, they signed a development deal, uh, that gave us a little bit of resources to sort of really turn it into a show, um, that they wanted. And then they greenlit that show in 2021. Um, and then wow. it was two years between when they greenlit it and when it, it came out. Um, so it was, a uh, last year we spent about 150 days working on the show in the field. And then, um, and then, you know, of course, spent about a year and a half in post-production from when production started till when it got delivered. So it was a six years start to finish process. And, you know, at, at any point in time, you know, in the first three years, people could have said no to it. So it was, a, you know, I think we believed in the project and we believed in Shane. So we, we invested the time into it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Talk to me about believing in Shane. Uh, well, I think I, I described already sort of the, the process of like, when we came up with this concept, uh, Shane had independently come up with kind of the same concept of the, the narrower version of, of the pitch, which was all about evolution in the age of humans. And, um, and when Shane came in and, and pitched himself as the host of this, of this series idea, um, that's when a lot of things really, really crystallized for us. And I think, um, that's when we thought, okay, this, this has a real shot because we had seen Shane not in like a TV contest, except, except, you know, in like a few minutes of this lizard documentary that we had made. Um, but we had seen him present his own, his own research on stage, um, you know, present in front of other scientists and stuff. And he, he was just, you know, he had that, you know, that, that wow factor. Um, we were like, this, we're, we're going to put this guy on TV and it's going to be really good. Um, and so, 
yeah, I think with him attached to the concept, you know, it still took another uh, couple of years. Uh, once, you know, the first time we actually pitched this was in 2019 with Shane. Um, the, the, the concept with Shane attached was two years after we had that first conversation with Shane about let's, you know, this sounds like a cool idea. Let's, let's try and develop this. Um, and then it was another almost two years after that before the green light happened. And then, uh, and then again, another about roughly two years um, to actually make the six hours of TV, um, which was definitely the most frantic part of the whole process. Cause that's a lot of television to make. Um, in this style with all the travel involved and stuff um, in over that, that time period. And I also just, another thing about Shane is I think one of the things that probably because Neil and I come from an academic background, I think um, finding, finding a host that not only is really engaging on camera, but like is the real deal, I think has always been something really important to us. And Shane is like, he's the real deal. He's not like a, a dabbler in any of this stuff. Like he is, publishing his science in the top journals, scientific journals in the world at like a, a rate that somebody who isn't traveling 108, 110 days a year making a television show is doing. I mean, he's just an absolute beast. And, you know, he's operating out of one of the top universities in the world, still running a productive lab. And he brings all that, that sort of credibility to it. But he also, he put so much of himself into the show. I mean, you really feel like, you know, his curiosity, his humility, uh, are, are there. And I think we just having become friends with him before that, we, we sort of knew that he would be up for that. Um, so, um, yeah, I think he's just really a remarkable guy. Yeah, you would never know, just like I didn't know his background from watching. He's just very down to earth and he is very, you know, kind of humble and curious and um he's also observes things well like a scientist would mm -hmm. uh but you really don't get the sense that he is this like heavy academic guy um he's really compelling and it causes you to want to know more along with yeah. him for yeah. sure well, he's he's a great he's a, a tremendous science communicator and i think it, it comes from that curiosity and the humility um, and, and even though this is his first, you know, sort of prime time hosting gig on this show, you know, he's definitely no stranger to communicating about science with, with non-scientists. He's had a, um, a podcast for a number of years, the science of superheroes, or is it, is it the biology of superheroes? I can't remember biology. the title. Biology of superheroes. And, uh, and that's, that's been successful. You know, he, he just gave a Ted talk this year. So like, he's, you know, he's, he's really, he's really, uh, very, very good at this sort of thing. And, and. Funny enough, you know, we're, we're not the only people to have discovered Shane. Um, and this is perhaps not not really our story to tell, but Shane Shane would tell you that he, you know, that he got burned at least once um, signing on to a project uh, with with another production company who really kind of didn't respect his expertise and what he brought to the table and wanted to sensationalize it and wanted to make it something that it wasn't and. Um, and so he, you know, he was very deliberate about about wanting to partner with us. And I think us having that same kind of training that he did um, and coming into the partnership with that was was instrumental in, in having the trust that we needed going both ways to make this work. Yeah, that's awesome. So you talked about a couple things I want to double back on. Um, you know, when we were talking about uh, you've got, I don't know, you said it took a certain amount of time. So seven years now you're talking from beginning to end. And there was about a two year period before I think you even made the first pitch. And so a lot of people uh, who are listening to this podcast are sort of in this situation where they have this idea. They really think it's, you know, a good idea. They found proof of concept. They don't have money. They don't know how to develop it without the money, but it's sort of this chicken and egg thing. You can't develop it and pitch it without money, um, you know, but you can't get to that pitch point until you have money. So talk about, you know, that in between time when you had this idea, you didn't have any money. How are, do you have other income that you haven't told us about that kind of floated you? Uh, did you take out personal loans? You know, what did you do to get to that point where you could pitch? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of give my answer and you can add anything. You know, we, we 
our production company, I think as it's scaled, we've been able to stay relatively busy now. It took us a few years to get off the ground, maybe three or four years before we were like bringing in stable projects and had reliable clients. But when we were pitching this project, I think we, we had enough projects to fill our slate, but this, this project we worked on in our free time and we used our income to pay for it. So, so like we, we definitely, um, there were a lot of nights and lots of weekends that we worked on this, um, you know, um, and, and then it was money that we would have otherwise paid ourselves coming in from other projects that we used to pay for development for the project. Um, and Shane invested his own time, uh, as well into this project. So we, you know, we just, we just cut all the corners and Neil and I have kind of always done that. I think, uh, we've always been very passionate about the projects that we want to work on. And so it's never felt like a chore to sort of put in those extra hours. Um, and the reality is like, you know, if you don't have a camera, maybe that's one thing, but if you've got a camera and a computer, it's just time, um, that you have to invest into it and you can sleep less, you can work on weekends. And <laughs> I don't know, that's kind of, that's kind of like, uh, we've been grinding for a long time. And I think if you want to stay in, this world and work on projects that maybe not everybody believes in at the beginning, like grind is a good, a good thing to do. It's a good lesson to have. I think it's never going to go away. Isn't it? I remember thinking that I was as busy as anybody I knew a long time ago and I couldn't possibly get busier. And somehow we're so much busier now <laughs> by so much than like every time I've said that to myself and I don't anticipate that, that changing. Um, so I don't know, that's probably not helpful to anybody. <laughs> but it's just going to suck. It's going to suck until it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 so it was a long time between sort of concept and pitch, but, but like Nate said, we were, we were working on a lot of different projects during that period. And so as was Shane, you know, Shane was going, was doing a postdoc, you know, in between grad school and getting his first faculty job. And so he was going into the field and doing research and, and it was just sort of periodically that we were able to all sort of touch base as a team and, you know, give a progress report and say like, how, how much closer are we to actually feeling like we're ready to pitch this thing? Um, and, uh, yeah. So I think, I don't know, I think just being persistent and chipping away at these things and, and we eventually got to a point where we felt like, okay, you know, we're, we're ready to make this sell to, uh, the highest bidder to some bidder, you know, God willing. Sure. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah. We're, we're lucky enough to find PBS. I, I also think, um, I think we, um, Neil and I had no idea what we were doing when we first started making films. We <laughs> showed up at these professional conferences and we cornered people and we told them all these ideas and they were the idiots for not signing up for them, you know? And I think <laughs> what we realized after doing that for years and, you know, taking stock of the successes and the failures that we had had was that especially big ideas you cannot bring to the table that are half baked. Like it's gotta be, you gotta have all mm -hmm. the stuff. Like these projects are expensive to make, you know, uh, a, a network is giving you in this case, enough money to buy a mansion on the beach in California, you know, um, maybe not a mansion, but a small house on the beach in California. <laughs> um, but, and so for them to invest those kinds of resources, like they, they don't just need the idea to be incredible. They need to know everything about it. And it's gotta be, gotta have an answer for everything. They need to see it all. And they need to believe that your company can, can produce that. And I think that that, that side of it was maybe not clear to us early on. And I think by the time we had gotten to the stage and gotten a few broadcast hours off the ground, we realized like if we, if we are going to convince a network to invest in this, like we have to make it, we have to invest the resources that it requires to convince them that, what, to show them what this is and to convince them that we can make it. Um, and so that, that, that I think played a role in sort of the long rollout. Yeah. I'm hearing a similar uh -huh. theme. It was similar in my story, but to other filmmakers we've had on the show, which is when you have an idea and you believe in it, you have to put what you have behind it, whether it's your time outside of other stuff and your own personal individual resources to just get the ball rolling. And I, quote Ken Burns all the time, you know, he said, you can't really learn how to make films sitting in a classroom and reading a book. You have to go out there and actually do it. And in doing it, you begin to learn your craft over time. And um, so the other thing you talked about is getting a grant. And I think the grant came before um, support from PBS. Is that right? 
Yeah, so there's there wasn't any grant funding for this project, but we can. I'm happy to talk about sort of other you know other grants that sort of got us started, got us over you know some of that initial hump of of first going freelance and starting our company. I see, I see. Uh, let's do that real quick because I am curious about that. Getting a grant is very hard, and you have to have a grant writer that knows what they are doing or have a certain percentage of grants they've won. Uh, tell us how you were able to accomplish that. Yeah, so I think I think this is another place where like our uh, naivete maybe played played a, a role in in our success because. Um, we didn't apply, we didn't even really know that like film grants were a thing. So we were applying for money in all these unexpected places or at least unexpected to, to most filmmakers, I would say. Um, our first big broadcast hour was funded through a national science foundation grant. Um, that was uh, a public outreach grant, basically, uh, attached to a researcher's active research grant. And so it was a grant supplement that allowed us to go in the field with uh, an amazing researcher into the Solomon Islands. And we made this film called Islands of Creation, which aired on Smithsonian Channel. Um, even before that, you know, we were applying for weird stuff. Like we, uh, our first film, our first kind of serious attempt at making a film together um, after grad school, uh, it was a film called Snows of the Nile, um, which had us uh, on camera as well as behind the camera. Nate and I were on the, an expedition climbing the Ruanzori Mountains in Uganda, which are these amazing mountains with glaciers on their summits, even though they're at the equator. There's spectacular, very tall mountains in Central Africa. Um, and we were there to document uh, photographically a century of climate change. There were these amazing photos from 1906, from the first summit expedition of these mountains that documented the extent of the glaciers. And we were going back a century later to uh, to photograph, try to recreate those photographs and, and document, you know, the, the glacier loss. Um, you know, we came up with this idea and it was like, well, I, I don't know who you, who you pitch this to. Um, and then we, I saw, I think I think I saw it first and yeah, I, I saw it. let Nate know about it, that um, Dos Equis, the beer company, had launched this grant called the Stay Thirsty Grant. If you remember, Stay Thirsty, my friends, was yes, the, of course. the most interesting man in the world. And uh, the whole idea was that as long as your project was interesting, um, they would consider it for funding. And, and so they, they uh, solicited online applications with little video pitches. Um, we did that. We were selected as a finalist. And then the, um, the public voted on the finalists. It was a massive sort of. And so we were pulling in all of our favors and our social media and trying to rally people <laughs> behind our cause and stuff. And we ended up getting, you know, what in retrospect feels like a totally inconsequential amount of money. It was, I think, twenty five thousand um, dollars to do this whole thing, you know, from from expedition to, you know, through post production delivery. Wow. Um, and, you know, an expedition to Central Africa to climb it is more than twenty five thousand dollars itself. <laughs> um, but 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 we did it right. That was it was the, that was the sort of jump start that that project needed, and we were. We didn't have a lot of other paid work at the time. And so we just kind of filled in the rest with sweat equity and uh, made a film. And that was the first film that we made that kind of got into a few festivals and um, got us some attention. And so it was it was not n not knowing, I guess, that getting grants was hard and maybe not applying for the same grants that other filmmakers were applying for <laughs> that, uh, that that, you know, got us over that initial hump. Ah, that makes but sense. At the time, we were applying to everything. I mean, we applied to every single grant that we could think of. A lot of them were science grants to work directly with scientists, but we were applying to grants at the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those initial grants that we won ended up creating the relationships that resulted in long term long term clients. But just I mean, like if I if I remember back to that time when Snows of the Nile was going, I was like photographing one year old birthdays and weddings and bar and bat mitzvahs to like get through, you know, and my, my, my wife at the time was in med school going like a half million dollars in debt. And every month I'd be like, honey, I, I don't know. You might, I might need some of your student loans to get us through this month. Wow. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I think that we really invested heavily in those, those early, those early years of grants and those early relationships. And not that your listeners need to, you know, hear this again, but those relationships that they, they make all the difference. People want to work with folks who, deliver good work and who are fun to work with. And I think, I think that a lot of those clients have remained people who we work with even back 12 years ago. 
Absolutely. Networking and relationships. It doesn't matter what business you're in. They're crucially important for success. Okay. So talk to me about PBS because when I initially researched partnering with PBS, I was clearly under the um, misconception that really you had to donate your work to, if you were an independent filmmaker and you had a film, uh, if you wanted it to be shown on PBS, really it was a donation thing. They weren't going to pay you for your work. Um, How does it work um, to work with PBS? I think you you have to pay them for your for your work. It's not just donate it. You actually have to yeah, pay APT to, yeah. to, to do it. It's like a yeah. But um, um, I, no, it's, I think that, yeah. The, the confusing thing is there's so many pathways, right? So like, if you want your film to go out on like the APT feed, and so that so that independent PBS stations in different markets can pick it up and air it if they want it. That's like a whole separate thing, right? And and you can make money with that strategy if a lot of stations decide this is something they want to air because then they have to pay the APT fees. And I think some fraction of that goes back to the filmmaker, although we've never done this, so I don't I don't know the numbers. Well, and I think you're you make your money back there if you have something to sell, whether it's a DVD or whether it's a book at the mm-hmm. end. Um, that was kind yeah. of my understanding that really that was where you would make money back on that. Anyway, okay. go on. Yeah. And then, and then there are these established threads on PBS, you know, there's POV and independent lens. And then like on the science and nature side, there's, you know, there's PBS nature out of WNET and uh, Nova out of GBH in Boston. And so for all of those, I mean, I know uh, POV and independent lens do some acquisitions um, where they're just buying films that are already made. Um, So that's a way in. Um, uh, with Nature and Nova, uh, I don't think Nova ever just buys anything. Nature sometimes does acquisitions, um, but I think primarily for those threads, you're you're pitching those commissioners with an idea and trying to get you know trying to get a commission. Um, and then we we went and pitched uh, pitched the headquarters basically directly um, in in DC um, because we kind of felt that um, they were one of the you know, the only routes with PBS that would uh, be able to to fund a project of the scope of Human Footprint. And I think we just got, you know, very, very lucky to for our idea to have resonated with um, with Bill Gardner, who ended up being our EP. And um, he was a tremendous advocate for the series right from the beginning. Um, and I think um, we've since learned just how rare it is to get a series like this commissioned directly through PBS, through the headquarters. It just doesn't happen that much. And so we feel, you know, very grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, yeah, to, to put this series out to such a, a tremendous audience. <laughs> how did you there, get that first? Funding. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the, the other route just with PBS is that local stations also have their own funding. It's just also very limited. So if you've got local stories, there's funding at almost all the, the PBS stations. Just right. it's like it's not not a lot. It's uh, almost almost donation level. For yeah. for for like a, a science or natural history series, there are a couple of, of local stations that are sort of like the most likely to partners for something like that. Um, and that's probably GBH and uh, Twin Cities, I think would be the, probably the two big ones that, that you see okay. some of the bigger okay. science series run through. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and primarily that the way that works is like a producer or production company will partner with that station in writing a grant to a private foundation or to National Science Foundation or something like that. And by running the grant through the station, um, they're able to, you know, to, to partner on some, on some of these larger projects. I see. So how did you get that first meeting with PBS? We've known Bill for a long time um, because Neil and I have been going to the Jackson Wild um, Summit every year since 2011. Neil, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So 2011, um, which is a phenomenal um, conference um, that uh, basically every other year it happens at, at, in, in Jackson Hole, uh, usually in Grand Teton National Park. Um, and it's very much an industry event. So it's a film festival, but it's very much an industry event. Um, the public doesn't really go. It's just uh, executive producers, filmmakers um, go, and it's a pitch meeting. You kind of just go and pitch stuff and hang out and party with your friends and um, and then recognize the work that, that, that this community has done. And it's a pretty tight-knit community. And um, we met Bill early in, early in that time. 
um, and I think pitched him a million different ideas. So he was he's probably gearing up for like, oh boy, here's another Nate Neal pitch that I'm going to turn <laughs> down. Um, but but uh, this this year we we uh, we had something that he was interested in. So um, wow. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'll I'll add to that just that like we go to these we go to these meetings, you know, the Jackson wild summit and others, like not with the perspective of like, okay, this is, this is, this is for pitching. It's like, we go there to see our friends and the, you know, the people that we've met and respect the most in this industry, like this is our chance to get to see them and see what they've been working on the last couple of years. And, um, and I think it, it helps going in with that attitude. Um, and the, the other, the other thing that I think has played in our favor over the last couple of years is that we put a lot of our own, um, work into that community. And I don't just mean in, the, in like the social networking way, but like we've been running a training workshop for, for young filmmakers and scientists that's been based at Jackson Wild for the last four years. And I think our work has become a lot more visible to that community as a result of sort of the, the service, for lack of a better term, that we're putting into that community. Not just the films that we're submitting to the, to the film competition, but, but because we get up on stage every year to present our, our students and our fellows work. Right. And so everybody kind of recognizes us now, even if they haven't watched our films. Um, so that's just another way, another way in another way to, to, you know, make yourself more visible in the industry you want to succeed in. Sure. Well, so tell me there's six episodes, right? Of human footprint. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me what the budget was for that. And did PBS cover all of that or advance all of that money to you? Yeah, so it was it was three point just just shy of three point nine million dollars for six hours of TV, and it was all through PBS through National PBS. And from what I gather, that's a pretty standard primetime science budget for PBS. It'd be more if it was at National Geographic or Discovery, but, but that's that's kind of what what PBS pays for it. And were you able to pay yourselves? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's some economy of scale that happens. You know, I think we we um, we took on so much more responsibility than um, than we'd ever taken on before, um, and we were able to pay ourselves a respectable income for kind of the first time ever. Um, but um, we're still, you know, we're not making like doctor doctor no. dentist money. You know? But most people that <laughs> yeah, listen to my podcast, yeah. including myself, yeah. have yet to take a salary for making anything. You know, it's more just yeah. let's just get this across the finish line. Um, you know, I, I guess I really do want to know what each one of you did on the film, because I know you were in at the beginning on the concept. But were you just producers? Were you actually shooting and the cinematographers? Were you editing? Like, what were you actually doing? <laughs> Um, I think we were actually doing a little bit of almost everything. So um, definitely we would consider ourselves, you know, the, the show showrunners and directors of the series. Um, I think either Nate or I, or in some cases, both of us was on every single shoot. Um, we did bring on a, an outside DP um, and that was for a couple of reasons. We wanted, you know, we wanted the, um, the series to have a really distinct visual identity um, and so we wanted somebody who was going to be there on every single shoot, you know, kind of running the show visually. And that was uh, Rick Smith, uh, an amazing DP out of uh, Bozeman, Montana. And um, Rick came to us also because he had experience shooting this kind of sort of run and gun, very conversation based kind of, you know, parts unknown esque kind of production. He had done this for, for a number of clients. And um, so he kind of whipped our team into shape um, in addition to being the DP just on sort of like the production logistics of like, how do you make a show like this? Um, but apart from that, I mean, everything on human footprint um, except for like animations and score was done by our team. Um, and so uh, that means, you know, me and Nate were in the field. Um, we had a few other um, producers uh, who would come out in the field sort of um, associate pr producer role um, we had a sound person, um, but but everybody on our team, you know, w whenever we've made a hire over the last few years, we, we always try to find people who are who can wear a lot of different hats. And shooting a show like this, where our crew was never more than six people, you know, wow. um, and you mostly know, five, mostly, mostly like wow. 
you, you have to have every, everybody pulling their weight and being able to wear multiple hats. And so, you know, the person who we made do sound uh, was uh, Georgia Kraus, who's an amazingly talented filmmaker, um, came to us from, from uh, NYU and uh, like really, you know, wanted to make their mark as, as a filmmaker and, and direct their own project. And we were like, Georgia, you're going to be our sound tech. And uh, I've never done sound before. Yeah, yeah. So, but but they but they they learned quickly. They they uh, they did a, an amazing job, and also you know shot time lapses when they weren't doing sound, and shot you know C cam when it when a scene required three cameras, and you know was and did DIT at night. You know it was like it was like everybody everybody was doing multiple things. And so I'll just add that this. Means, that means you know camera. That means you know, logistics, that means uh, heading up sort of the, the editorial on, on post-production. Although we didn't really edit it all on this one, did we? I edited a little bit of the replacements, but that's the only time I edited. Yeah, yeah. once post-production I'll, I'll just, really got cooking, we, we were not hands-on console editing. We were mostly just reviewing other people's work. Hmm. So what I'll tell you is that I loved the way this whole operation unfolded. So I loved, you know, every interview, it'd be either Rick and me shooting or Rick and Neil shooting and all the cinematography be like Rick doing handheld or Neil and I in the gimbal or long lens. I and mean, we shot a lot. Um, we, we were shooting all day, but we were also producing and we were also directing and our filmmaking staff, everyone, everyone who works at day's edge come from filmmaking backgrounds and they were appalled at our, like, <laughs> you gotta have a person who does this. And, um, and, uh, we, we don't, we don't, um, we don't like that. And I don't think we're going to do that. Um, I, I like, I like, <laughs> I like how we do it. Um, well, and again, and, uh, yeah, it, come, it kind of comes from a place of ignorance, right? Like we're not, we're, we're, we don't, we don't come from a film background and we came as solo producers living on different coasts, trying to impress each other with our films we were making. And so each of us learned to do everything and yeah. we've always done everything and it feels weird not to do everything. So um, <laughs> and I still do don't know what a director does. Like I, I'm trying to like, <laughs> like in, in like the documentary world, people are like, what, what's the director? I'm like, I, I, I don't know what a director is. Like you're, you're shooting, producing and like you're telling people what to do and you're doing it yourself. Like to me, sometimes people will call us up and they'll be networking being like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a natural history director. And I'm like, I, don't even know what you do. What do you tell the animals what they're supposed to do in front of the camera? Like, I just like, I, I don't, I don't get it. It's truly um, it's really but, puzzling when, when you ask that question and then you're like, so, so you shoot then they're like, no, no, I don't shoot. I just direct. And it's like on a natural history film, what does that even mean? <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it's even on a show like, yeah, it reminds on a show like me. ours. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nate. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say on a show like ours, it's like you, you produce it and develop it and then you know what the story is. And then like, you know, in the interview, while you're, you're listening to the interview while, while you're shooting it. And so you're just like trying to keep track of what's happening. And like, there's not a lot of directing. It's like, we just need, um, Shane, we need you to walk over there and um, talk to this person. And, uh, like, and we film that. I mean, like, I, I don't know. Is that different from producing? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I see, the funny thing is we say this and, and, and I'm sure our staff is like, like, like who the F is directing this scene? Can somebody just direct this scene? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah, it kind of reminds me, I had a friend who, uh, she's with the old school Chicago ad agency. And one day she walked in sort of as a, they were, she was hired as a on, on for a little while to replace somebody else in this, you know, ad agency. And they had just fired all the old guard they brought in young kids that were doing social media. And she was like, we have this big pitch to, you know, I don't know, Budweiser. And they have no idea what a pitch is. And they don't even know how to talk to the client. And they, you know, it was this all breaking all of these rules because they had no idea how it was supposed to be done. Um, and it really was this very weird, uncomfortable thing because there's always been a way of doing things, particularly in filmmaking. Everybody has a role they have to fill and everybody thought or thinks you have to have all of those people on every shoot. But the truth of the matter is in this documentary world, the run and gun don't have a lot of money. The people that are able to be nimble and do five things at once are the ones that are getting it done. And I think that's just the new version of filmmaking um, where we're, you know, documentary stuff is concerned. It really yeah. changes a lot um, once you get to the narrative and you do have to have oh, those shoes filled yeah. for sure. 
Yeah, yeah I, I just I, I feel like for me, I'm just viscerally uncomfortable on set when anybody is standing around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're paying you to stand around and like tell us where to to move. Uh, yeah. that, but you know, the thing that I found out is that the directors are king in the film festival. Like that still has not changed. Like. They right. really only want to talk to the directors at a f film festival, you know, um, or in a magazine. Everybody wants to talk to the director. And that is troublesome when it's like you guys, where it's really like a big stew that everybody's throwing <laughs> stuff into. Who's the cook? Well, we all kind of are, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, if I'm um, being perfectly honest, I'll say that's why we listed ourselves as directors on the in the credits of this one, <laughs> so, that, so that we could take all the glory. <laughs> Uh, all right. So we just, we're kind of running out of time. We may have to do two episodes. Do you guys have a little bit more time? Yeah, I can stick around for a bit. Okay. Yeah, so maybe. Jason, what do you think about breaking this into two episodes? That sounds great to me. Okay. So we do have uh, two filmmakers who have brought documentaries uh, for DocuView Deja Vu. And so I'm going to make an executive decision here. And we're going to give one at the end of part one of this interview and the other at the end of part two. So now it is time for our favorite section, which is DocuView Deja Vu. All right, Neil, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell us a documentary that you recommend and why and then where we can find it. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I decided, uh, I thought about this a little bit, that uh, I think one of the coolest films that I've seen that, that has probably flown under a lot of people's radar, because it's kind of niche in a lot of ways, is um, a feature called Particle Fever, um, which I think I saw in like, I don't know, 2015, 2017. I can't remember exactly when it came out. Um, it follows these physicists at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, um, the big particle accelerator. You know, it's like the biggest piece of scientific equipment in the world who are trying to understand, you know, like fundamentally what are the building blocks of the universe, you know, at the smallest possible scales. Um, and... You know, it, it struck me when I first started watching it. I was like, I was like, I think I had to watch it because it was, I was doing some preliminary judging for a festival and I was like, Oh, particle, particle physics. Like that's going to be really a feature like, woof. and then I watched it and I was just absolutely absorbed in it because of the way they followed the characters through like two years of sort of the building of the instrument and the suspense that was building as they were trying to find these, these answers. Um, basically they were trying to discover the Higgs boson. If you remember that, that phrase from the headlines from several years ago. Um, and it was just like the stakes for the characters were so high. Like they had invested their entire lives and careers into finding out what the like mass of this mysterious particle was. Um, and the filmmakers did a brilliant job of of giving uh, some of the characters cameras and having them self shoot at times when the filmmakers couldn't be there, oh, and wow. so it's like this deep coverage over um, over like a full like two year period of a bunch of different characters that 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 culminated in like a real true moment that they filmed in real time of like scientific discovery when they the first wow. numbers started coming back from this instrument. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's brilliant. Um, a lot of the magic is in the edit. Um, it was edited by, um, oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. Nate, you, Godfather you're Godfather guy. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah the Godfather. What was his name? Jason. Um, Jason Rugg is our button pushing guy. He usually can figure this out. Jason, <laughs> who is it? <laughs> Walter, Walter Merch. Walter Merch. Yeah, Walter Merch. Walter Merch. Yeah. Walter Merch, Walter Merch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Edited Apocalypse Now and a bunch of like huge Hollywood, you know, legendary films. So I don't know how they got him to edit this, but it's like the edit is just it's it all comes together in the edit. You know, it's mountains of material just woven into this absolutely brilliant and, and to me, just like riveting story that I cared nothing about when I started watching <laughs> the film, which I think is like exactly what you want. Uh, any movie documentary or narrative to be right. Like is it just absolutely captured me? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Where can we find this one? Uh, whew, great question. Um, uh, J sure Jason, our button pushing guy can figure it out where I'm to sure watch. It, I'm sure it's streaming somewhere. Curiosity stream. It's streaming on curiosity stream. Oh, cool. That's where you can watch it. If you have a subscription over there. 
All uh, right. A, a subscription to Curiosity Stream is very inexpensive, so um, I I would recommend it for anybody who's into science or nature. It's a great place to to see some cool stuff. For sure. You, you can also rent it for like four dollars. So sounds right. like an awesome thing to check out. All right, Jason. Actually, use- I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing about that. The animators that that worked on that film are also the animators that worked on Human Footprint. And oh, we found wow. them and approached them because of their work on Particle Fever. I love wow. that. That's awesome. Wow. That's so cool. Awesome. That is cool. All right, Jason, you said you had one today. Yeah, <laughs> mine is actually Human Footprint. I want people to just <laughs> watch this show because it is so insightful and made me think so much. And uh, <laughs> one specific episode, I don't know how specific we want to get with some of the episodes that aren't out yet. Um, but there, there was something that had occurred to me and made me like kind of angry in the past. And then you guys covered it in one of the episodes, which is all of the golf courses in Palm Springs. <laughs> I, was, I was out there in 2021 and it was just like, this is like a monument to human stupidity. Like there's just so much grass in this insanely hot, dry environment. It was just like, and I was there during the summer. So they let them all dry out because, you know, no one goes to play golf in the summer. Right, right. And you do a, an entire segment of one of the episodes about it. And it was just so vindicating to me. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> someone else saw it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, I want people to check this thing out because it's just so fun and interesting and it it's never boring. Every segment is like, it just stays just long enough to give you a massive amount of insight and then, and then gets out right at the perfect time. So I just want everyone who's listening to this, go check it out. It's on PBS at uh, every Wednesday at nine. Is that it? Yeah. Most, most markets. Central. It's, it's eight central in a few places. Um, but yeah, you check your local listings. Usually nine. Okay. Well, I'm going to Jason, go ahead. I, I was going to say, no. can I tell you the, the, the story about the, the grass act? So that was the first shoot that we went on. Oh wow! And none of us knew yet what human footprint really was. Like we had ideas, we'd all, you know, we had these group planning meetings about how it was supposed to look and feel. And um, for me, that that act, when the grass act kind of came back, the first edit came out. Um, our, our, our one of our lead editors was Andy Laub, um, and it came back. And I remember watching it and feeling like we're going to make an awesome show. Yeah. If we can make an <laughs> awesome ten minutes about grass, we're going to make a great. <laughs> Um, and I, so I, that that act, I, I'm I'm very proud of. I think we worked we worked hard on it. Yeah, awesome. very memorable. That's so I was cool. going to save this uh, to the next episode, but we're already here, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, so you know, this was very ambitious. I mean, from grass, you know, here in Palm Springs, all the way to you know boa constrictors, or uh, I I forget what kind of snake it was for the first episode. Burmese Remind Python. me. Yeah, Burmese python. Uh, you're you're all over the place. So super ambitious. How did you hone in for the topic of each episode? You know, how did you come up with this topic for filming the grass? So from the beginning, you know, we we created as soon as Bill suggested we transform the show into something that was about how humans were, tra- you know, impacting the planet and not making it evolution specific. We um, originally we had thought of the series as like a, a limited series, and so you know we we had figured out topics that you could all kind of slice and dice into a limited series. But then after that, we were like, oh god, so many. So we wrote this massive list. Neil, Shane, and I got on the phone. We wrote this massive list of topics. Some of them were a little bit more theoretical and heady. Some of them were like straightforward, like invasive species. Um, and so we had this big long list, and then we selected the thirteen we thought were the the most interesting. To people and and the sort of not just the most interesting the the ones that were also so intricately woven into the fabric of our lives where it's like we just we kind of can't exist in the world without these things being a part of them and we presented those 13 topics to pbs after our development contract and then they picked six the six that they thought were going to be the best the best ones for, for the first season and then um each of the acts in those episodes we, you know, if, if folks watch the first episode, we really try to take people on a journey that starts them from a place where like the most basic argument is there. So like with the invasive species act, it's like invasive species, bad native species, good, which is like the pythons in that case. So nobody wants pythons in the Everglades. So we start with that. And then we sort of move a little bit further down the timeline 
with the species, the Asian carp, which got there in the 50s. And it's more complicated now. They've already ruined the fisheries. They've already messed up recreation. People are starting to adapt. And then we go deeper into history. Horses, whoa, horse advocates really want them to be here. And they don't have bad arguments for why they might want them to be here, but they haven't been here for longer than 500 years. And there's a lot of negative impacts that they have on, 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 on the landscape. And then we go even deeper, a thousand years, uh, the pigs that were brought into Hawaii that, that, that have become intricately woven in Hawaiian culture, a culture that has been hugely impacted in, in negative ways because of colonization and losing the pig, which a lot of biologists think are invasive species, would just be another blow to a culture that has already suffered tremendous losses. And sort of kind of taking people from what they know to maybe make them question things, each of our episodes tries to do that, where we lead people down asking more questions. And the goal is not to say, hey, this is the right answer. The goal for each of the episodes is to pick the stories that are visually interesting, that will have interesting characters, where the stories relate to culture that all of us can identify with, that end us in a place where we're like, wait a minute, I don't know if I understand this as well as I thought I did, is sort of how we pick the stories. Well, it worked on me. I got to tell you yeah. that because <laughs> I am not a snake fan. So I was all on board with you at the very beginning. But I love horses and I actually love Hawaii and history. So by the time you got to the end, my brain was like, oh, no, now I don't know how I feel about this anymore because I do love horses and think they should be around. And I do love history and can understand how the Hawaiians do not want to see the pigs eradicated and would be another blow to them. You bring in a lot of those questions that re make you realize that this is a much bigger and more complex and more nuanced problem than that we can just solve by eradicating everything that was invasive. And I think that you, yeah. you really ended that first episode on such a, a poignant question, um, which was, are, are we the invasive species? And I, I think that that really set the tone for the entire rest of the series. Cause now I'm, I'm viewing it kind of through that lens of like, yeah, but what have we done and what will we do? <laughs> and I think that was, that was a really incredible way to end the first episode and set up the tone for the rest of the series. Well done. Very yes, well done. Well Thanks. done. Appreciate it. So we're going to divide this into two episodes. Like I said, I have a bunch more questions still to go. They will give us a bit more time. Uh, so tune in next week to hear the rest of um, what it took to put human footprint together. Um, I want to give you a real quick update on uh, documentary first and what's happening with Heroes of Carentan. Uh, I've just gotten back from Europe. I was there for a month talking to the 101st Airborne soldiers as well as the different um, officials in Carentan about this next film that we're doing i interviewed you know nine different individuals at fort campbell and i'm so excited about the story that's coming together we really are looking at how the past can be informed by our present modern day soldiers who've had experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan and now on the Ukraine border. Uh, it's a really interesting way to make history come alive and also to help us understand what is you know going on right now with our soldiers, what they're thinking, feeling and doing in light of the conflict um, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so that's what we've been working on. We're working on the script right now. We're working on developing the log line and the synopsis and that is uh, consuming a lot of our time. So that's what's happening at Documentary First. And Jason, I'll let you take us out of here. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.